Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Purdy Insurance. Visit Purdy Insurance on Market Street in Sunbury or visit online at purdyinsurance.com. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. All right, let's get to our play by play call of the day. He is throwing it deep for the end zone, and it is batted around, and it's and complete. complete, and the game is over, the game is over. The Philadelphia Eagles are Super Bowl champions. It is a call the Eagles fans have longed to hear. The Philadelphia Eagles are Super Bowl champions. Now think about this. The Philadelphia Eagles will be the only franchise in the history of football to defeat Vince Lombardi and Bill Belichick in championship games. Huh? Have you heard anybody else tell you that? That's a first for me. Hey, They're the only friend. They'll be forever the only franchise to defeat Vince Lombardi and Bill Belichick in championship games. Because remember, Lombardi only lost one playoff game, and that was the Eagles game in 1960. And the and in that one, the Packers were nine yards away from winning it at Franklin Field. All right, wrestling. Bob Buner, the Neville's lot. It's the greatest loss I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, whoever would conceive of a guy losing a match and getting a standing ovation from nearly 7,000 really rabid fans. I mean, they, they were, I mean, everyone was going insane in that place. I mean, no question it, about he, it. I mean, it, it's the only time I've ever seen a place go insane because their guy lost by a little. <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, we did have the Super Bowl of the NFL on Sunday, but we had the Super Bowl of college wrestling on Saturday night. I don't know that there's ever been such a dual meet as the one between Ohio State and Penn State at Rec Hall. Well, that's the, best du- that, 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 two. That, that's the best dual meet I've ever seen. Now, again, I did not, I did not get to the until it was. At the intermission, it was fifteen. I looked. I go. It's fifteen to five. I'm like, okay, because I, yeah, yeah, I had and, to finish. Um, up, I, I had to finish up at the Jordan Center with basketball. So yeah, and um, I tried saving the seat. I was uh, first row uh, off to the one side, and I was holding the seat for you. And some guy named James Franklin came and sat there for a while. But <laughs> yeah, he was. There were a lot of, yeah, he, and, he and Fumi were both there. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of uh, a lot of uh, his. Uh, team uh, were there, too. Uh, you know, the place yeah. was going crazy at 7 o'clock at night, an hour and 15 minutes before the start. That's how intense it was. And, you know, Steve, there was this air of apprehension that everyone was not talking about in that one of the five returning national champions, Jason Knopf at 157, was not going to be in the lineup. You know, that lineup... Right. That lineup featured 17 ranked wrestlers and would have had seven returning national champions in one dual meet. Right. And, and that's, that's, remar- it's, that's remarkable. I know not having Nolf, that brought with it apprehension. What was it like? Now let's get to the part that I wasn't around for. Okay. I, I wasn't there for the first five bouts. Well, you know, so um, obviously, obviously Zane won by a technical fall. And I guess what it was a one point loss for Nick Lee. Yeah, Nick Lee lost on riding time at one forty one. I mean, it was one of those at the buzzer. There's the riding time. He loses seven six. People at Penn State were counting on his win. So you you lose Nick Lee at one forty one. You have Jason Knopf off the board at one fifty seven. 
It was real grim at intermission, to put it mildly. But what happened right before intermission? Well, I know. I, I was like, I, I looked up. I, I'm stunned. <laughs> yes. And, uh, you know, they had um, the first two weight classes, Penn State put out uh, basically transfers who came in um, and against some really top fellows uh, for Ohio State. Yeah. And yet they were just regular decisions. Uh, so Penn State was thinking maybe they'd be down anywhere from 10 to 12 to 0. It was only 6 to 0, or 7 to 0, right. excuse me. Right. And then Zane Rutherford, in what I think is unprecedented, Steve, scored 19 unanswered points wow. to get a uh, technical fall right at the buzzer. I mean, you give up escapes here and there when you're scoring points. He didn't give up any. Amazing. It really was. And that technical fall, you know, that that and a few other of those bonus points uh, really made uh, the difference. I'll be honest with you. I know Kyle Snyder is the Olympic champion. Oh, but no, I've really felt yeah. the I've really I've really felt the last two years pound for pound Zane Rutherford was the best college wrestler in the country. Well, he last year he did win the Hodge Award for the best yeah. college wrestler, but you're right. You know a, a, a fact is that Zane Rutherford has never lost a dual meet. In his stellar four-year career, not once. Yeah, uh, yeah, all of his has been postseason. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that was he lost three times in his freshman year, and that was it. Yeah, uh, once I think in the Big Ten championships, and then twice at the NCAA's. Yeah, and that was about it. And so he's just been on an incredible roll, and he got down to the shock of everybody, four to one, two takedowns by the his Ohio State opponent. It's four to one, and oh my gosh, you know. And then all of a sudden, he turned it on, and I think that momentum carried into the intermission. And of course, now we have some three returning national championship wrestlers in the second half of that lineup. Well, Vincenzo Joseph did what I thought he would do. Yeah, I thought I thought Mark Hall wrestled a thoroughly brilliant, intelligent cerebral match. He, he certainly did. He was uh, really in control, but at any, it felt like if any one time he could uh, give up a five-point move. But he just great hit position, great control, and uh, in the end, really dominated. That was um, yeah. that was a really good match uh, for Penn State again against one of Ohio State's better wrestlers too. When I thought they had a chance, though was when Bo Nickel got a bonus point in a one-versus-two matchup. Yeah, you had It's a one-versus-two. On, he got a bonus point. And those guys were both undefeated. Yeah. Uh, 22-0, and 0, the Ohio State wrestler, and Bo 20-0. and 0. And then getting that one point, and all of a sudden, in people's minds, the, the kind of fans like me that are keeping the score ahead of the match, you know, like, what about this at the next weight class? What about that at heavyweight? There was a glimmer of hope throughout Rec Hall, I have to say. But you still had well, this, but, this, but, but this then when Kassar did what he did. But then oh, when Kassar did what he did. <laughs> well, yeah, like only beat the number one guy in the country, and he is on ranked. You know, that just doesn't really happen an awful lot in college wrestling. But he was so motivated and so intense. And, uh, you know, then that set the heroics up at heavyweight, Steve. Well, I thought I give Kassar all the credit in the world. I mean, oh my goodness! I, I mean, I thought going into the week that uh, uh, Shakur was going to go. Well, and, they thought uh, they they really they, thought that, and all of a sudden he was announced. You know, at the uh, at the opening up uh, part of the match when they do, do the lineups, and people were looking at each other like, "Huh? He's going in? What about the other guys?" Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, um, yeah, Matt McCutcheon's an option there, too. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. my gosh, they have three guys who could end up being ranked in the top ten, but unfortunately only one can wrestle for Penn State at a time. And so, yeah, that was, I think, um, some people might call it a gamble by Kale Sanderson to play with that lineup as he did, and other people call it brilliant. Well, you give Kale the benefit of the doubt on that one, I think. Yeah, no, it was. And then, then what Devils did. You know, you could tell right away. I, mean, I, I don't know about you. I mean, you're sitting there in the front row. I'm, you know, I'm not. 
<laughs> okay, okay, but that's what happens to the late arrivers. Yes, yeah. There, yeah. there was a crowd there that was in, sort of in front of you, I would say. To those who sneak in. Um, <laughs> and I don't really, I didn't really sneak in. But yeah, I'm sneak in. People I, that were guarding I, I, the doors I, I, were at the watch in the mat. I, I, yeah, but I, you know me, I don't sneak in anywhere. You know that. Yeah. Uh, no, you don't. <laughs> um, but. It, he took him down, but even after that, I felt midway through the first period there was no way on the planet that Snyder was going to be able to major him because I just thought Neville's was wrestling that well. Yes, and 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 Neville's had great, con- even though he was down a little bit in the points, he still had control. And, and of course, in the third period, when the place is approaching a combination of pandemonium and bedlam. Uh, he was still. He kept his cool and great positioning, and uh, Snyder couldn't do a thing that he needed to do. And you know, Snyder was keeping score too. He knew what he had to do to oh, win. Oh yeah, you know, no, he knew. And yeah. you know, it's one thing I was saying to one of my friends that was w- with me. I said, you know, forever Neville's is going to say to his grandchildren or great grandchildren, yeah, back in uh, 2018 at Rec Hall. I was ahead of the world champion, the Olympic gold medalist, and NCAA champion, and ended up winning a dual meet for my Nittany Lions. And there's not a Look, lot of people that are going to be able to say that. This is this is the equivalent of what the headline should look like for Nick Nevels when he talks to his children and grandchildren. In 1969, 68, maybe 68, 1968, Yale had gone two years without losing a game. They went into Harvard, and with 45 seconds to go in the game, Yale led 29-14. to 14. Now, the Harvard team, the offensive line for Harvard included Tommy Lee Jones mm-hmm. and Al Gore. That's right. Roommates. Okay. Roommates. Okay. But Tommy Lee Jones was the starting guard for the Harvard offensive line. Harvard scored a touchdown, got the onside kick, scored another touchdown, two-point conversion game ended up 29-29. Harvard Crimson, student newspaper on Monday, Harvard beats Yale 29-29. Okay? Right. Neville's beat Snyder ten to fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, and that that's what it felt like uh, in Rec Hall on Saturday night. You know, it never was a loss so highly celebrated in the storied history of Penn it's State. It's the wrestling. first time in my life. No, Penn State in anything. It's the yeah. first time in my life I ever saw Penn State in anything where. Penn State lost, and everyone went insane. This is the greatest loss ever. <laughs> <laughs> One of the ops, I have a. I was sitting with a, a, a with another friend who is uh, a four time All American wrestler for Penn State, a one time national champion, and he knows what he's talking about when it comes to wrestling, obviously. And what he said to me made so much sense about Ohio State. And here's what he said. Those guys are cutting too much weight, and they all gassed in the third period. That's what happened in Rutherford's match, where he got the technical fall, two bonus points. That's what happened with Bo Nichols at 184 when he was wrestling an undefeated wrestler and got a bonus point at the end. I think that's what happened uh, with Nevels. He it was a strong at the end, just as strong as Snyder was, and Snyder really didn't have much gas left in the tank. So I think there may well, be an issue it, there with, with uh, Ohio State and Penn State, well, which we hope bodes well. I'll agree with the first two. I won't agree on Snyder, and that's because Snyder had just wrestled, uh, what, in Russia? Yeah, he was in the, he, the, like, the yeah. Yarrigan tournament, which is one yeah. of the great wrestling tournaments for, in the world for – you know, and, beyond college, you know, it's like right. a, it's like an Olympic warm up. It's really what it right. is. Right, and and you know, you know how you feel when you go back and forth to New Zealand, Bob, because you go yes. to New Zealand all the time. You it's know a how you long feel. Haul. There's no question. Yeah. You'd, yeah, he he had that. There's no question about that. And um, he was, uh, yeah, he was a bit exhausted. I mean, when he got his hand raised in front of the crowd, chilling, chilling, or cheering for Neville's, he did not look like the guy who won the match. No, no, because 
Well, no, he knew they. You know, look, if he gets if he gets the bonus point, Ohio State wins because they scored more dual meet points. Yes, exactly. Right. So the criteria so. was really in Ohio State's favor, and I think I'm sure that Kale Sanderson and his crew kind of figured that out going you know into that match. What did they need to do to win? If it came down to criteria, and the answer was nothing. Nothing. I mean, did, did Neville's had to go out and keep it. <laughs> Right where it was. Yep, keep it under I mean, eight even, points, and he kept you it can even five. see, But you see even Neville's, I mean, he's the first guy I ever saw that, like, lost and, like, smiled. Yeah. <laughs> he was there. How about that? Huh? And, you know, uh, the thing that happened at 197 pounds with Kassar is that after the match was over, he his hand was raised. The Ohio State left wrestler left the match somewhat defeated, or obviously clearly defeated, but d- downcast. And and Kassar did a bit of a victory nap, and somebody said to me, why is he doing that? And I said, because I think he just won the dual meet, and he beat the number one wrestler in uh, college wrestling. But other than that, you know, it's just a normal match. Yeah, other than that. Yeah, so Bob, a, a pleasure. I appreciate right, it. Uh, a pleasure, you know, I mean, don't quite have the pull you do to be down there on uh, Matt's side, but that's all right. But you got it's who you know, and it's, I'm fond of saying. <laughs> you you are you are connected, my man. I uh, thankfully, thankfully am. So Steve, um, great show. Thanks for allowing me to be on and share the Super Bowl of wrestling. Yeah, well, I hope you're feeling uh, better. Last time I saw you, I thought you looked pretty good. I'm doing a lot better. Thank good. you so much. Oh, my good friend, it's so good to hear you. Same here, Steve. Take good care. Yep. Bob Buner, Matt side. It's all about who you know. I assume the suit watch from home. I would. That's probably right, Sean. Absolutely. It goes back to who you know. All right, we'll come back for a moment on this Radio 1070 WK. Okay. When it comes to car buying, there's the other guy's way, and then there's the SMC way. The other guys force you into a vehicle you really don't want. The Subway Motors way lets you take the time you need to browse, ask questions, and take the test drive and think on it. For over 100 years, the Merth family and all their employees have made your experience the most pleasant one you'll ever have. The other guys won't offer you the best price for your trade, no matter how much they say they will. The SMC way is their promise to provide you with the most money the market shows your vehicle's worth. The SMC way is to offer you all applicable factory rebates on new vehicles and generous discounts. Looking for a pre-owned vehicle? The SMC way checks each vehicle in a 200-mile radius to determine the lowest price, then beat it. It's the lowest price promise, just part of the SMC way. The choice is up to you. The other guy's way or the SMC way? The SMC way wins every time. Sunbury Motors Company in the North 4th Street Auto Plaza, Sunbury, and at sunburymotors.com. Selling more cars and satisfying more customers for over 100 years. Well, we've talked a lot about wrestling, a lot about the Super Bowl. Just very something very quickly about basketball. They've won three of their last four games, uh, and they're now six and six in the league. They're now sixteen and nine overall. Uh, they're three and one since Josh Reeves got back, and they're playing really well. They've got Maryland coming in here on Wednesday. Here's a chance to get above five hundred in the league. Here's a chance now to get a seventeenth win. They're, you know, you just got to keep winning in this thing. Uh, you do that, and the stakes can then become high, but you can only get there by just keep winning. Uh, an issue the first time around playing at Maryland was the 34-4 to disparity in free throw attempts in the game. I had no issue at all, zero, with the 34 attempts that Maryland took in the game. None. I said that, I said that the very next day. Uh, I may have said that because it was in a good mood after the Fiesta Bowl. I don't know. But I, <laughs> but I said that the next day. I said what I had an issue with was Penn State only having four attempts. Because if Penn State were sitting out and taking jump shots the entire game, then I could absolutely buy four free throw attempts. How many times have you heard me talk about either on a game broadcast or on this show about style of play will dictate what kind, of, how many free throw attempts you get. If you're not playing the style of play, it's going to get you the line. You don't deserve to be at the line. 
Well, Penn State was not playing a jump shot game. They were driving the ball to the bucket with Tony Carr. They were driving the ball to the bucket with Josh Reeves. They were driving the ball to the bucket with Jamari Wheeler. They were getting the ball to Lamar Stevens. They were driving the ball and getting inside with Mike Watkins. They got four free throw attempts out of that. Four. Four. A team that played in the first ten minutes of that game, Penn State took jump shots. A lot too many jump shots, but they took a lot of jump shots. They didn't deserve to go to the line. In the last 30 minutes, they played downhill. Still didn't get to the line. This is what kind of an issue it is against Maryland. Maryland this year has made 409 free throws. They've made 409. The opponent has attempted 337 against them. Remember, Maryland's made 409. The opponent's attempted 337. In the Big Ten, it's 191 made for Maryland, 177 attempted by the opponent. So it's been an issue in Maryland games. Why? I mean, Cowan can play downhill, so can Herter. They're both two really good free-throw shooters. But after that, no. No. So it's a big game, but again, for Penn State, because you know what? Going into this game... If they just won by 24 points, again, the really good teams don't play a lot of close games. The really good teams blow the other team out. Penn State has 13 blowout wins this year. They haven't had 13 blowout wins in a single season in the 21st century. No, that's that's not a joke. Well, I think Penn State's very good. And I also feel like right now, I think we're seeing them play their best basketball. They have to keep it up. They've got Maryland at home on Wednesday, then they're at Illinois Sunday. And they put on a dunk fest on Saturday. They had 10. I've never done a game with 10. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. All right, great to have you with us on the show today. I, I, to be honest with you, I can completely understand why they took as long as they did on the Corey Clement touchdown play. But for the life of me, I can't understand what took so long in the Zach Ertz play. I mean... He caught the ball, he's running with the ball, and he's diving for the end zone like a runner. What took that so long? It was interesting. The Clement play, they called, they said, stands as called. And to be honest with you, I thought the game was officiated. There were no pass interference plays in the game. None. And the replays... I think replay is there to create to correct errors. Replay is not there to make the game perfectly officiated. Where you go back and forth, like okay, okay back and forth. I, we got to get this exactly right. It's going to be perfect. Look, you can't. I mean, it's too hard to do. It takes too much time on some of these plays. It's there to create to correct errors. It is not there to make it perfect. And I thought that the way the game was officiated was no issue. And I thought the way the replay thing was no issue. I just thought they took too long in the Earth's play. I think that that was just, it was, it was too obvious. Remember, I thought the Jesse James play was the touchdown, too. This was more obvious than the Jesse James play. Yeah, they had the owners' meeting coming up before the draft. Hopefully when they start to go through some rules changes and modifications they can try to uh just clear the air and finally you know come to the complete complete definition of okay what is a catch (laughs) well i think i yeah i think that you're gonna what's interesting is that the more they simplify it the it seems like the more difficult it becomes but just all this stuff about you want more offense in the game do you got to really carry the thing to the ground i mean seriously if you want more offense in the game, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. there was a little bit of a, a little bit of a juggle. Oh, for goodness sakes, just boom, move on. I just wonder how many football fans that are out there, not not hardcore football fans, that just everybody, those group of people, just automatically assumed once the ball breaks the plane, whether you're a catcher or a runner, it's automatically a score. Yeah, well, I think uh, there are a couple things I, uh, I want to get to about about the game. First of all, let's get to um, the coaching part of it. Doug uh, Peterson deserves to be universally applauded because he did exactly what we talked about on Friday. (laughs) Plain and simple. All of us said, look, be aggressive. Don't back off. Be who you are. How many times have you seen in other Super Bowls where suddenly teams don't seem like who they are? That's not the team I watched. How many, how many times have you ever heard the words, that's not the team I watched all year? Well, I think more and more you're seeing on these Super Bowl games, the reason the 21st century has produced a lot of great games is teams have played and have been who they are on both sides. Well, the Eagles played that way. They played like the Eagles did all season. Now let's give you one in a game that featured very little defense. Let's talk about two defensive parts of this game that were that were actually really important. Number one, Tom Brady, who, by the way, had a brilliant game. <laughs> I'm sorry, but 505 yards and no interceptions <laughs> and no punts? <laughs> You're going to tell me, oh, yeah, we beat Brady. Oh, yeah, you beat Brady, all right? <laughs> he put 33 up on you. <laughs> he did pretty well. Uh, but you know what they took away? And this was a great move by Jim Schwartz. Whether Deion Lewis was in the game or James White or Rex Burkhead, didn't matter, especially when James White was in. He had Malcolm Jenkins cover him everywhere. So he put his best cover guy on one of their backs, and you can tell the Patriots didn't expect that. Okay. The other defensive part was no Malcolm Butler for whatever reason. Now, Butler did not have a particularly great season. So, I mean, let's start with that, just so you understand. Pro Football Focus, uh, Chris Collinsworth group, group, Pro Football Focus, they do a great job with ratings and so forth and using analytics. They're terrific with it. Uh, Now, but you can use it as a guide. It's not an absolute, but you can use it as a guide. There are 64 starting corners in the NFL, right? Malcolm Butler was ranked 48th this year among corners. But the guy that replaced him in this game, Rowe, was ranked 188. And they went after him and after him and after him. He made a couple nice plays, but for the most part, I mean, they just went after him. And those were two coaching things right away where you looked at where, you know what, Schwartz did a good job by getting Jenkins on, especially James White. And then the call at the end of the first half on the fourth down play. The Bears ran that play against the Vikings. Now, the Patriots have a guy named Ernie Adams. Ernie Adams is a guy that maybe you haven't heard of, but he's Belichick's guy where he breaks down every tape of every opponent of every game over years and then comes up with everything they do. Guess what? not on the tape. The play the Eagles ran for the touchdown to Foles on fourth down. Why? They've never run it before. When the... When and I, I apologize for not knowing his, knowing his name. But the Ernie Adams on the Eagle staff, when they were getting ready for the Vikings, saw the Bears run this play with Mitch Trubisky. And so they looked at each other and said, hey, we could put it in. And they put it in for the Viking game. But because they blew them out, they never ran it. So when they were in Philadelphia, they practiced it a couple of times at a totally closed practice. They decided that when they got to Minneapolis, they would not practice the play because 
there are too many designated in and out times for pool reporters and media. They didn't want anybody to know they were doing it. The next time they practiced it was at a closed, every door shut walkthrough on Saturday in the hotel ballroom. And remember, Trey Burton played quarterback against Penn State for Florida in the Outback Bowl. So I knew Trey Burton was a quarterback. I've already announced a game where he played quarterback. But he also has never thrown a pass in the NFL. Never. Has an attempted one. That's why Ernie Adams, as brilliant as he is, couldn't give Belichick that play because that play in the Philadelphia doesn't exist. Remember the Malcolm Jenkins, in, uh, the Malcolm uh, Butler interception against Seattle. Seattle had shown that play earlier in the year, and the Patriots worked on that the Friday before the Super Bowl because they'd done it two years earlier. But this play, the Eagles had never run before. They stole it from the Bears and the Vikings, who probably stole it. You know, and of course, you remember the uh, Oklahoma ran in the in the Rose Bowl. All right, Dick and Milton. Dick, how are you today? I'm sure you had a great time Saturday night, like all of us did. Well, I just I just told Sean I'd be quite anxious. I'd be lying to you if I thought we were going to come back and win that match. I mean, it took it took almost a, what I use the same a perfect storm with with Nichols and Nevels and, and it just did. It was Kassar. Uh, but we won, and that's all that matters. So, uh, we were destined to win it, I guess. <laughs> but my, well, like I said, man, I, 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 I looked up. I go, it's fifteen to five. I'm like this isn't good, because <laughs> because yeah. I, you know, obviously with the post game, I couldn't get there till intermission. Well, and the other thing, the big thing was with with North being out. Basically, you know, he doesn't lose. So now we give up five points. So that's as much as a eight point swing if he gets three up to whatever. Right. You know, sure. it's, a, it's a it's a big hole to fill in a sense, but. Uh, I'm excited about this week. Iowa's not as good as Ohio State, but yeah, he's still got to wrestle the matches. I guess there'll be some good individual b- bouts. Mm-hmm. That league is yep. phenomenal. In fact, I just looked out of the top ten kids at 125. So I think six of them are in the, in the Big Ten. What a what a Big Ten! That, once you watch that, it might as well go home. That's going to be right. incredible. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, really good. It's going to be amazing. But my question was on the NFL. How can Cleveland always get such poor draft picks? And why would that be? And, and what do you think happens this year? Do they do they go after a Barkley, or do they just go to some somebody that won't help them again? Well, they've got picks one and four, uh, which is an interesting spot for them to be in. You feel it's somewhere in there they have to get a quarterback. Can you imagine if they take two quarterbacks and they both bust? <laughs> But every year they have to get a quarterback. That's my point. Yeah. Every year they have to get a quarterback, and every year they next year they're looking for a new one. I know, and that's and that's what's kept them just at the bottom, except for one season when Kelly Holcomb got into the playoffs. That's the only time they've been to the playoffs since the franchise resurfaced in '99. But they need to get a they need to get a quarterback somewhere in this thing, Dick. And then after that, it's going to depend. I mean, for example, say Barkley is sitting there at four. I think you got to take him. I, I really do. I think you have to take him to get all of a sudden that one-two punch at quarterback and at running back if he's still available as long as you get the quarterback first. I, I want to make one quick point about Nick Foles. I think a lot of people are thinking that the Eagles will deal Nick Foles. Why? You've got $14 million in two quarterbacks because Wentz is still on his rookie deal. You don't know, really, if Wentz is ready for opening day. To me, you keep Nick Foles. He's $7 million a year, slightly made a little bit more than Wentz does. You've got teams paying 20 to $25 million for one quarterback. The Eagles are paying $14 million for two. I, I say keep him, and he's your insurance policy to start the season if Carson Wentz isn't quite, quite ready. I mean, there's some people I've heard saying, oh, they'll deal or you know, deal in the Cleveland. The only way I can see Cleveland not going with a quarterback is if they acquire Kirk Cousins. Well, I do know another team that's going to be looking for a quarterback real soon is is the New England Patriots because their backup quarterback should be playing at San Francisco. So, Well, I mean, Garoppolo is really good. He's very good. Uh, I, I was impressed by what he did with the 49ers. Because the 49ers transformed themselves into a very good team when he started playing quarterback. Now, and that's the part that, that is mysterious about Cleveland. Why is Jacksonville now good? 
Well, Jacksonville is good now because they took the fourth overall pick in the draft and they got a quarterback. They took the seventh overall pick in the draft, or no, fourth overall pick in the draft again and got themselves a running back. They got Jalen Ramsey in the first round. You start ticking off Fowler and all these guys that are first-round picks, Marquise Lee, and you look around and you say to yourself, well, they darn well better be good. They've had nothing but first-round picks in the top ten for the last eight years. That's what's mystifying about Cleveland. So have they, and they're getting worse. You think they're not a very good evaluator of talent? Dick? You and I are better evaluators of talent. Yeah, but somebody, <laughs> But you would think eventually they would get lucky with somebody. I mean, I don't well, understand. The one, the one player that, without question, was a perfect draft for them was Joe Thomas. I mean, Joe Thomas is a Hall of Fame left tackle. Um, but they've missed on Wyatt. Now, losing Josh Gordon for years, but that was Gordon's fault, did not help them. They haven't had a good running game. When they took Mack, and I think they dealt him to Atlanta, notice how Mack has been in the playoffs in the Super Bowl the last couple of years, and he's been the pivotal guy in the offensive line for Atlanta. He used to be the linchpin with Joe Thomas of the Browns' offensive line. I mean, they have been a textbook on how to do everything wrong. Yeah, they haven't had a good quarterback since Otto Graham. Uh, I would agree. Well, I would agree with that. I think Brian Sipe hung in there. How about that? But that's pretty uh, sad, though, when you think about it. Put it in perspective. It's pretty sad. And that's you know, and you look at teams. You can talk about what the Eagles did. Oh, look, Nick Foles just proved you can win a Super Bowl with Nick Foles. But they got there because Carson Wentz was so good all season. It's like the year Jeff Hostetler won the Super Bowl with the Giants. Phil Sims was the quarterback for 80% of that season, and they ran out to, what, an 11-1 record that year. Uh, so if you have a really good starting quarterback and get somebody, the Browns, and you're right, Otto Graham may be the best quarterback they've had. I mean, Frank, Frank Ryan won a championship for them. Bill Nelson wasn't bad. Brian Sipe was okay. Bernie Kosar was pretty good. But, boy, since they got back in the – in 1999, when Kelly Holcomb is your best quarterback, you might have an issue. The other thing that's hard to believe is because the Indians are, are have been very good. They play, play and Cavaliers have been very good. Yeah, and there's the, there's the Browns all these years just doormats. This year they were actually that's the worst performance I've ever seen a football team in the NFL ever. Maybe this year. It's hard. It's hard not to win a game. I don't care who you are. Oh, I know. I mean, Detroit went 0 and say that. Everyone's praising Jim Schwartz for the great job he did with the Eagles. He was the head coach of the Lions when they went 0 and 16. Uh, well, it'll be interesting next year because the Eagles will be the. Everybody will be after them. And, and of course, everybody will be still picking Pittsburgh and basically and, and New England, I guess. Well, yeah, I think people will pick Pittsburgh and New England. But again, Pittsburgh played Jacksonville twice at home and never led in 80 minutes. I mean, that's what I've tried to tell Steeler fans. You know, they might be better than you. And if the Steeler fans don't want to hear that, I'm, I'm like, okay, tell me which part of the two games at home were you leading? How about none? Um, the Eagles Wait. have their franchise court. I mean, the Eagles have, to me, what the new Tom Brady is going to be for the next 10 years, because I think Wentz is that good. I think he's very good. Uh, coming back from an injury, you never know. That's always a crapshoot. I was going to say, but, but if you look at the Steelers with Roethlisberger and New England with, with, you know, with Brady, basically these guys are reaching a point where these teams are going to have to be looking for a franchise quarterback. No Somebody question. Somebody replace them. No question. And they, they're going to have to come up with some sort of Aaron Rodgers type of solution where that guy is very talented. You were able to get a steal in the late round, at the late first round, you're able to get a steal because Aaron Rodgers, remember, he kept falling, falling, falling. Then he backs up far for four years, takes over. Like, uh, check out this gem. That's what I think. You know, I thought the Patriots had that in Garoppolo, and again, that's a mystery as to why he's in San Francisco to me. I could understand it, but I will tell you this: if it, when it's all said and done, I'll bet you that both those teams get a better quarterback in the draft than what the Cleveland Browns do. <laughs> which, is, which is 
priest, man. <laughs> I'm going to let you go on that. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Browns keep on browning. <laughs> yeah. You, you got to give the Browns credit. I mean... <laughs> Oh, what's it like to wake up every day <laughs> in the Cleveland Browns office? Factory of sadness. Right, and you're looking around at each other saying, okay, we can't foul this up again. Can we? <laughs> <laughs> they got It's the one team out of the 32 that could take two quarterbacks in the first four oh. picks and they'll both go down the drain. <laughs> oh. I mean, they're getting the right. They're trying to get the right people in place to make the decisions. But when you got Jimmy Haslam there, who wants another? Who, who I would not be surprised if he would number four would take Baker Mayfield because he wants another Johnny Manziel in there. It would. I wouldn't put past it one bit. It's funny. Uh, Deshaun Hamilton played in the Senior Bowl with Baker Mayfield and with Josh Allen. And he said that Mayfield is a lot like Trace McSorley, but, you know, I mean, and Deshaun's a little prejudiced, obviously, you know. It's, um, you know, you know, it's always going to be his guy. He thinks Trace is better than Baker Mayfield. Okay, I can buy that because there's a lot of things I think that Trace does that is better. They happen to be better. He, he said he, Allen reminds him of Hackenberg. Big arm. It was interesting to listen to his comparison because after the Senior Bowl, he played with both of those quarterbacks. Mayfield does have that little bit of moxie to him, all right? That little bit of, you know, he's, he's, he's got that little swagger to him. Darnold throws three-quarter. He is not an over-the-top thrower. Now, if you're going to talk about pure mechanics as a quarterback, Rosen has the best pure mechanics of any quarterback in this draft. But people who evaluate and have been around him, and it's not as if I don't know somebody who's been on the UCLA staff the last couple of years, because I have and do, well, not there any longer, but Rosen doesn't quite have the arm strength that people think he has. Okay, he does not. And that's something that's starting to surface now, that he has a really, really great mechanics, but maybe not the strongest arm on the planet. And then there's Allen. The biggest concern I have about Allen is this. I know, and I and remember, I remember I talked about Carson Wentz, and he was going to be you know, in the draft. You know, how, The difficult part was, who are the people you're playing? And Wentz always played well no matter what. But, you know, you're still going up against FCS corners and FCS safeties and so forth. So you do have to have at least a concern about that. Well, he's proven he can quarterback anywhere, anytime. I, again, I think he's the new Brady. Um, But when you look at Allen, when you have a, an NFL quarterback rating of 31.7 against Power 5 teams, Nebraska, Iowa, people like that, that's a concern, that when he faced those kind of teams, he did not get it done. Now, remember, too, that's also an FBS Power 5 defensive front he's facing that's putting more pressure on him, too. But if you get picked high in the NFL, what kind of offensive line are you going to have? It's all relative. So, I mean, when you look at the quarterbacks, and then there's Mayfield, then there's Tanner Lee. I mean, Tanner Lee throws a great ball. I mean, the whole deal, but... You know he's a bat. He's destined to be a backup quarterback, maybe starting a few years down the line for somebody somewhere. I mean, I've, you know, it's Nate Sudfeld, the Eagles' backup quarterback, to me is a better quarterback than Tanner Lee is. And you know, hi, I was on Nate Sudfeld when he was in Indiana. I really liked him a lot. Well, it's been a fun weekend. Hockey was down two goals on Saturday. Rallied to tie Notre Dame. Basketball ran Iowa out of the gym. Now they got Maryland coming here for a big game, 6.30 on Wednesday night. Most exciting dual meet I've ever seen in my life. And then a Super Bowl for the ages. And Philadelphia is still standing. Sort of. 
We'll talk to you tomorrow on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Purdy Insurance. There are a lot of places to get insurance coverage, but only one place in the Susquehanna Valley ready to put four generations of experience to work for you. Hi, I'm Adam Purdy. At Purdy Insurance, we take the time to talk with you and find the right coverage for your needs. Everyone's situation is unique, so our approach is to customize coverage to best protect you. Whether it's home, auto, or business insurance solutions you need, call, email, or stop in to see how our commitment to personal service can help protect what matters to you. You're listening to News Radio 1070 WKOK Sunbury. You can hear us anywhere in the world with the Sunbury Broadcasting Corporation app.